We turn now to a small neighborhood in New Orleans and a football program that aims to do much more than just win championships. Washington Post sports journalist Kent Babb follows a high school football season in his new book, Across the River. In a state that had the highest rate of homicides per 100,000 back in 2019, Bab's book is a stark look at the fight to keep young students out of the line of fire. And now George Clooney has snapped up the film rights. Bab spoke to Walter Isaacson alongside Nick Forster, a former football coach at the Edna Carr High School. Thank you. And Kent Babb and Coach Nick Foster, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you for having us on. You have this wonderful book, Kent Babb, called Across the River. It's about Edna Carr High School in a troubled part of New Orleans. It's about kids surrounded by gun violence and an amazing coach named Bryce Brown who helps rescue some of them. Tell me the arc of the story and why you believe it's an American story, Kent. Yeah, I believe that in most cities in the country, uh, there are places like Algiers, you know, where people who look like me are just perfectly content to not think about it, you know, not pay too much attention to sort of go along uh, your business and stroll down the French border, pretend like that's not real. And, you know, there's a sort of incredible drama that's playing out. I mean, these are real lives and um, real vulnerable lives as well. You know, and they come uh, to these coaches, Coach Foster and Coach Brown, you know, to uh, to look for guidance, to look for mentorship, sometimes for food. And, you know, football is just something I think that that draws them to the football office. And then from there, they start uh, retraining them for real life. You know, Nick Foster, you were part of that Edna Carr High School football program, and you really had two paths in lives. And in some ways, you tested both of those paths. Tell me how this program and your life was changed. Well, I, I went to car, but also I coached that car. But um, that that culture, our, our school family is just a big part of who we are. You you gonna always have two choices: you go left, or you go right. All right, and we know that left choice is not always the best decision. But when you go right, it's just a blessing and an amazing feeling. And we teach the boys all the time. New Orleans is a very adverse city, right? Either you could be a part of that or you could change it or you could be a part of something different. And that's what we offer them with football. Um, I went through a, 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 a lot of adversity in my early years of coaching as can't put in a book. Um, with, with my mother passing, um, that was tough, but I relied on my car family and he got me through that. And also with my dad, um, we won the state championship 2019 and my dad passed away that same night. And only thing that got me through that was my car family. So just like we helped those players, those players helped me. They still call me every day, check on me. They're so proud of me. I'm a head coach at St. Aug now. And it's an amazing feeling. It's bigger than just, you know, football and us, our success on the field. It's about our success off the field and helping these young men grow into better citizens. And uh, Kent, when you were seeing that, when you were covering the Edna Carr School for that one season, what was the magic that the coach brought to this? I mean, it's almost not even magic. It's something so basic, and that's just honesty. You know, if some if a kid comes uh, to, to the coaches with the crisis, no matter the hour, no matter the crisis, you know, they help deal with it. I mean, the way that I put it is it's the rarest kind of mentorship. It's consistent. And, you know, it doesn't matter what time of day. It doesn't matter, you know, if it's 3, three o'clock in the morning. These coaches, for better or worse, will answer that phone. They teach these kids to know how to trust and know who to trust, who to come to if if you're out of money and hungry, who to come to if you need a ride across the river to a, an unfamiliar neighborhood or to get back home. You know, not just walking around in a city where bullets are flying all the time. They know the answers. The coaches know the answers. Sometimes these kids don't. And so they learn that there's a there's an office full of adults who won't give up on them. If this is a country and maybe even a city that's just completely content to write off young people and young people of color in particular, there's one office uh, in New Orleans that, that that's not the case. Like they can come at any time of day, doesn't matter the situation, and they will be supported and guided and mentored. You know, part of the story of this book is the story of gun violence. Nick, will you tell me about the gun violence and how different it is today than it was when you were growing up? You know, when we had altercations, sometimes, you know, it might get to 
a physical fist fight or something like that. But New Orleans had got to the point now where it's evolved where these kids got easy access to a gun and, you know, they don't even have, know how to handle altercation. So like Ken explaining, they come to us when they're in adverse situations and we try to, you know, detour them away from using a gun or even, even using violence, right? We, we try to change them off, off the field of uh, how to handle a confrontation, how to talk things out. Right now in the city of New Orleans, there's just so much crime with adolescent kids and with the guns and everything. We just find that football is an escape for those kids. I mean, it's not only gun violence, like killing each other down there. We have robberies, like just a lot of carjackings by adolescent kids and stuff like that. But it's so easy to get a gun and you know, they, 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 they don't know how to handle, like, if they have a disagreement, if they have a confrontation. That's why we teach our kids how to handle it. Like, we actually teach these kids how to deal with these adverse situations. We teach them how to, like, when they get pulled over by a police officer, how to deal with that situation. We teach them, like, if you get in a, if, you, if your friend is in a uh, negative or uh, uh, beef situation, a uh, controversy situation, that's not the guy you need to be hanging with. You need to be friends with the, 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 the guy who's going to school, who's going to practice with you every day, your teammate. And if you see your teammate doing this, hold him accountable and let him know right from wrong. Once we start spreading this type of thing through culture, like Bryce says, cancer, like cancer spreads. You want to spread good cancer throughout your team and throughout your culture. So once we start teaching kids in the community to do right and wrong and what's right and wrong and it be accountable, I feel we could find a solution for it. But right now with them having so much easy access to guns, and don't know how to use a gun and know how to handle confrontation, it's going to be them killing each other. Ken, tell me the story of Tonka George. So Tonka is a young man who did everything right. Uh, in 2010, he led Carr to the state championship games. He's the skin and bones punter and wide receiver uh, who got thrust into being a quarterback uh, because he was willing to sacrifice himself. Um, and he was almost a supernatural leader uh, who could inspire somebody uh, and chew out somebody else, just whatever it took. Uh, so they got to the state championship in 2010 on Tonka's skinny shoulders. Uh, he got a college scholarship. He played college football at Alcorn State, got this degree. He was not involved in crime or drugs or anything like that. But he made a mistake, and that mistake was coming home to see his mom. He came home to New Orleans, and while he had been gone getting his education, some of his friends from back home had gotten themselves mixed up into something really dangerous. And the, his second mistake was taking a walk in his neighborhood on the West Bank uh, on a warm June night five years ago. And somebody in a car saw him, followed him, and got out and shot and killed him. And it, it's a heartbreaking story. But as much as that, it's also uh, maddening because nobody knows why he got killed. You know, nobody knows who did it. You know, five years later, uh, his murder, like so many in New Orleans, remains unsolved. I mean, this is a city that recently has only solved uh, a third of its murders, which is excruciatingly low. <clears throat> and, you know, Tonka was supposed to be somebody that everybody looked up to, somebody that, er that, that people at Carr longed to be like. And, and he, wound up, he wound up being sort of the opposite of that. He's somebody that you can't be like this, even though he did everything right. I think he was the person that changed the car program forever because Bryce was at the crime scene. He was in this sea of chaos. And I believe it was at that moment that Bryce Brown decided my program is not just about football anymore. It's, it, he's got two relentless dual missions. One, yes, is to win football games. The other is to keep his kids, the people that these coaches care and love, uh, care about and love, keep them alive and teach them how to survive no matter what. He was one of those kids that everybody followed. Right. And, you know, everybody looked up to, but he was something to look up to. I mean, he still has the record in the state championship for the most yards in one game, things like that. And it was skin and bones, like Ken mentioned, but it's just a special blessed talent and just guilty by association. Um, you know, his, his murder still is a mystery and, you know, it's sad. You know, his number five is a special number in, in, in Carr's program and our family. And the kids really honor that number. Like, if they wear it, they make sure they, you know, they, they try to live up to it. But it's it, it's a sad story. Um, Bryce keeps his jersey, a picture, a shirt of, of, 
of talking in his office and just walking in there every time and just remind us of, you know, it's bigger than football. It's bigger than just winning. Like we got to really save lives. We really got to help these kids because the gun violence and everything they're going through is like, he's not, he's not even involved in that type of life. But just being guilty by association, by your next door neighbor, a guy you grew up with, you could easily lose your life in all this. And it's sad. This program at Edna Carr High School, and I hope what Nick Foster is now doing at St. Augustine High School, is teaching people not just football, but the skills of life. It's almost hoping to rescue some of them from going down the wrong path. Explain that in your book. I mean, based on my observation, football is the thing that gets these kids through the door. You know, they want to play. They want to get on the field. And who makes that decision but the coaches? And it's not always how well they perform on the field, how they catch passes, how they block defenders. It's about character. It's about communication. It's how you talk to your fellow person. You know, and, and what these guys do is they simulate almost as a conditioning exercise how to deal with these confrontations. I mean, it's uncomfortable. I, I've witnessed plenty of them, sometimes late at night, <laughs> but it's uncomfortable. <laughs> He's laughing, but I, it's uncomfortable. Why, why are you laughing, Coach? Well, um, he's referring to something when you read the book is um, at Carl, we used to call it what they call it pride panel. And what we do, we simulate um, pressure situations. So it teaches them how to think, even on the field. Everybody think because we won, you know, a couple of state championships, we come from the X's and O's and the plays. Now it comes from the binding and the brotherhood and we make them go through an adverse situation. So when they're on the field, when they're in the community together, they know how to handle it. Kent, tell me the story of Joe Thomas. Joe was somebody that before I started reporting this, I don't think I would have believed he was real. Um, so he's a senior linebacker when the book begins, uh, just like kind of this inglorious run stopper, uh, not a guy who makes sacks or anything like that. Um, but he, he quite literally grew up on the streets of New Orleans. Uh, his mom was on the wrong side of the law, had been since she was a teenager. And Joe was her lookout. You know, he used to stay up until three in the morning with a little gun in his hand, making sure nobody came for his mom. And so he he grew up as a protector. And as he grew, it was almost like there were two people in the world, Joe and his mom. He didn't know how to communicate. He certainly didn't know how to communicate with adults without being confrontational. Um, and he had just never been held accountable in his life. He had never been held to a, to a schedule in his life. And so he's somebody that has completely changed how I look at communities like this because it's just too easy to think that it can't be that bad, that somebody like Joe is made up. It's not. I mean, there's a lot of Joes out there, not that many Coach Browns and Coach Fosters. And the fact that like Joe, Joe learned these tricks of survival that seem unnecessary in the United States. I mean, if you walked to McDonald's to get some, some dinner, he never, he never came back the way he, he went, just in case somebody was following him and, and trying to hunt him down and kill him. He had to hide in abandoned houses because whether it was real or imagined, uh, he believed somebody might be chasing him at all times. He felt like he had to protect himself. When the book begins, uh, his mom is in prison Joe was living by himself as an 18 year old young man. Uh, his senior year is getting ready to start and he's got an eviction notice posted to his front door. He has no idea how to deal with this. How do you deal with that when you're 18? It's over $80. He's about to be homeless over $80. So what do you do? I think if not for the car program, he would have made a very different decision, but because he played for Edna Car High and because he had these coaches, he knew who to go to and they helped him get out of what could have been a life changing and possibly life ending jam. When Katrina hit, Edna Carr is on the West Bank. It's across the river from most of New Orleans. And so it didn't flood. And Edna Carr High School became a place where people from all over the city, when they came back, had to go. So you had a lot of people from different neighborhoods going to Edna Carr. Uh, Coach Nick, tell me how that affected things. Well, um, before Katrina, Edna Carr was a magnet school. So we had to take a test to get in car and it was a, you know, most people from Algiers went to car. It's this tight knit community, very small. It was a three A school. And after Katrina, you know, a lot of the schools on this side of the river on the East Bank really was closed down because of there was underwater. Well, car was one of the ones that survived the storm. 
So all these kids from on the other side of the river started coming in. So it wasn't no tests. You know, we just had to get kids in school. Now, at first, we thought it was a bad thing because, you know, it was a car and certain people can only take that test and be in our family. But it actually expanded our family and made it amazing. We was getting a different type of athlete in car, a different type of kid. More kids with adverse situations, more kids that wanted more. They wanted out of LG. So they used car as a, as a pad, as a channel to get out. So they used football and education. Our car was able to offer them that. Kent? I mean, I think it made people from all over a city that's, at least from my observation, is extraordinarily territorial. You know, this is a place where <laughs> people grow up on a certain block in a certain neighborhood and they don't always leave that block and they certainly don't trust somebody who doesn't live on that block. And so, right. you know, what Katrina did is it, it uprooted everybody, including you know, some sort of uh, some decisions that were from sh uh, short sighted city officials. Um, it, it uprooted everybody and forced everybody into unfamiliar neighborhoods. So what that did is raise tensions. And in the case of car, it made people, it made so many people have to filter into this one place and not just have to coexist with each other, but to line up beside each other and play with each other and learn how to learn how to and learn how to uh, pursue opportunities and victories together. You know, you learn, you had to learn how to trust. You had to learn how to rely on these people that didn't sound like you or supposedly look like you. They weren't from where you're from, but suddenly you're on the same team. Coach Nick Foster, Kent Babb, thank you so much for joining the show. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it.